welcome to my talk on using Go for platform engineering. Um, so during this talk, uh, we'll define what platform engineering is and how Go fits into what it means to build robust developer platforms that enable technical excellence that leads to sustainable growth. But before I continue, um, I wanted to give, uh, to share a little bit about me. So I'm currently a tech lead for the New York Times observability team, uh, which sits under our wider platform engineering organization. And so as someone who is responsible uh, for the direction of my team and as an engineering leader across all of the times, I spend my time thinking about the function of platform engineering story, of our platform engineering story and how it can facilitate success across all of the times. Um, and I'm not sure if that this is how well known this is, but uh, the Times has actually built a lot on Go. Um, so this is partially where, that, uh, where this talk is inspired from. And so before the Times, I was also a platform engineer. Uh, and again, so this is just a compilation of the consistent approach I have brought uh, to each of my roles. And ultimately what that looks like is coming from the perspective of enabling our department to work in a way that ensures long-term sustainability. And so like I mentioned, this is gonna be in the context of Go and how it can enable this work. And so first, let's uh, start off by defining what platform engineering even is. And so as much as I hate repeating words on a slide, I'm gonna do it if only for emphasis. So platform engineering drives sustainability by practicing socio-technical principles that provide a strong support system for application developers using our standardized shared platform architecture. Now that's a lot, um, but these three highlighted components from the ba uh, form the basis of what it means to uh, provide a developer platform. And so we'll spend the rest of this talk decomposing each of these components, which are the principles that guide us, the support that enables application developers, and the architecture that we build and use along the way. And so first, we have the principles that guide the rest of our platform, right? Having focused on reliability management within platform engineering, uh, the principles we'll review are heavily influenced by DevOps. Uh, I'm not sure how, how familiar people are with the DevOps principle. Um, but specifically because DevOps principles take a strong consideration for both the technical and social components of what it means to develop and operate software. And so now we'll head into those principles. Um, so some of us may, have not, may or may not have heard of the comms framework. Uh, it was coined by Des Humble, uh, Jez Humble, sorry, uh, a co-author of Accelerate, uh, which is a popular book in the DevOps space. Um, and it's basically a framework of principles that should be the core of a DevOps organization. And so, now, while I, all five could certainly be applicable here, I'm gonna focus on three. Specifically, culture, automation, and measurement. So starting off with culture, uh, the comms framework tells us that it drives a culture of continuous improvement and reduces silos by intentionally sharing knowledge and feedback. And you can note that while I did remove the S uh, in the previous slide in comms, uh, the presence of it, shares, uh, the presence of it uh, shines through this anyway. And the same is true here for platform engineering, right? Though I'll talk, in a bit, talk about it mo more directly by putting it in the context of communi community, um, which I think Cameron's talk uh, feels very relevant here. So super glad you already laid some foundation there for me. Um, so we often talk about emerging uh, or breaking down silos in DevOps. And that is ultimately the problem that DevOps emerged from. And the way that we bridge that is by sharing knowledge. And to share knowledge is means to connect. Right? And I think this is particularly important for organizations where Go is its primary runtime. Right? While Go has an increasingly vibrant and helpful community, like Cameron just mentioned, right? it's, still on a, in its, new, it's still a newer language. Right? It's, still, it's just over a decade versus other languages have been around for longer than I've been alive. Um, and so there's still a lot of talent that needs to be evangelized and supported, especially amongst underrepresented groups. And so sharing knowledge is particularly important for us. And to do this effectively, we need to think about how we can cultivate a strong community that fosters this, scale, this culture at scale. And so some models um, I've seen at previous and also at the times uh, is to do this through learning uh, communities, right? But this com while this is a common approach, right, it's also a common pitfall that uh, this work is often undervalued, right? And so there also does need to be some executive buy-in. If there's any tech leads, C-suite people, et cetera, please keep listening. Um, there needs to be some pie in that this work is important and that it ultimately it's incentivized, it's incentivized and supported work, right? And in aggregate, right, right, if, com if companies continue to commit to learning opportunities, not only will it bring the company forward, it will bring the industry forward by bringing more talent into the space. And so next we have automation, 
which improves our software delivery process by reducing human error, improving efficiency, and enabling faster delivery. This means thinking critically about the type of work that doesn't require business-specific knowledge and figuring out whether that work can be consolidated into software that's managed centrally by platform teams. And in this, right, we reckon that we reduce the cognitive load product engineers often have to indulge in by managing all aspects of their software. And the type of work that's important but can be consolidated in an automated or centralized way is work that's repeatable and manual, which SRE often refers to uh, toil or what product engineering often refers to as like boilerplate uh, software. Another aspect of platform engineering is how we should be explicit about improving efficiency by leaning into solutions built by third parties, by third parties, whether that's vendor solutions, open source solutions, et cetera. And the reason for that is because we need to reduce our own cognitive load just as much as product engineers. And a lot of the work that can require subject matter expertise, whether that's to manage infrastructure, build CI CD pipelines, build runtime packages, um, but reinventing the wheel here is not supposed to be the inherent function of platform engineering, right? No matter how tempting the technical challenges can might be. And large companies often set this precedent uh, to build everything on house. I say this as someone who used to work at Google. Um, <laughs> and sometimes it genuinely is necessary, right? But that shouldn't be our first instinct. And the reason for this, again, is like directly tied to sustainability. Um, hiring for very specific skill sets is hard, right? People often leave. Um, I'm sure we've all been in uh, situations where someone announces that they're leaving and all of a sudden we're like, oh crap, how are we gonna continue to support this tool? Um, we're facing that right now at the times with the Golang framework that I will be touching on soon. Um, and so that said, I do have to, I would be naive to not mention that there is like the vendor lock-in issue that can happen, right? Uh, which is why I think paying close attention to open standards and open source is like a super underrated skill set of platform engineers. Right. For example, I said I specialize in observability. Um, we have the emerging open telemetry standard, uh, which targets this exact problem, right? And so being able to be driven from that perspective has enabled us to potentially consider moving off of our vendor if we so happen to be unhappy with it because the costs are way too high. <laughs> Suddenly everyone's knowing exactly who I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> uh, but. To elaborate on my point about open source, right, it also presents an opportunity to practice good industry citizenship by being contributors to the, stan to the standards, right? And contribution means, takes many forms, right? It's not just code contributed, right? It also means providing feedback, evangelizing their efforts and whatnot. Cameron's like, yes, please come help us. <laughs> um, our industry benefits from open source and standards and we all have skin in the game um, because it ultimately keeps our entire industry forward. And lastly, we have measurement. Right? First, let's talk about the function of measurement, which is ultimately to have feedback loops for whether your work is actually having its intended impact. And these feedback loops consist of both quantitative and qualitative feedback loops for continuous improvement. And the way this principle uh, connects to sustainability is again by limiting time work uh, spent on work that doesn't ultimately lead to business goals. Right? For example, if a tool that we've spent a lot of time on uh, is actually not being adopted, right? we've now wasted time that could have been serving uh, direct user cases. And so we end up missing the ultimate goal, right, which is to enable uh, product growth in a sustainable way. And so okay, now that we've defined our principles and now very high level, uh, we'll shift over to talking about the support strategies uh, for applications uh, developers that are integrating with our platform. And we'll speak to both scalable and flexible tra uh, strategies and put it in the context with the ways that we measure success, consolidate efforts, and cultivate a culture that values sustainability. And the first is the most scalable strategy of all, which is to make building sustainable software easy. Right? One of the things that we really love about Go is how easy, it's, how easy and readable it is. Right? And so we'll deep dive more into this in the next section when we talk about platform architecture. But to set the stage for that, right, sustainable organizations are directly tied to their ability to build sustainable software. And what we mean by that is software that ages well with evolving business needs. And I'm sure, I, think I mentioned this earlier, right, I'm sure we've all worked with uh, software that wasn't built probably with much foresight, right? This is what we usually refer to as technical debt. Right? And tech debt is inevitable, but we can mitigate its risk by being intentional and strategic about when and where we inject tech debt. Right? It should have a function, usually for the purposes of growth, and tools that aren't easy to integrate with are a type of technical debt that typically doesn't pay off in the, in the long term. 
So it's especially our duty as platform engineers to build easy to use tools to minimize the time that uh, developers spend needing to, this, sorry, <laughs> uh, to build easy to use tools to minimize the time that we spend needing to support application developers. There I am parched, so give me a sec. Cool. So that's not to say we shouldn't be willing to support developers, right? It's nothing worse than like someone throwing over, throwing a tool at you and saying like, good luck, right? Um, <laughs> we just need to be intentional about when the right time to support is, right? We talked about measurement as a principle earlier, and an important part of that um, is, of our effectiveness is like the adoption of our developer platform, right? So what intention looks like here is ultimately defining the ways that we approach support and clearly communicating it uh, to avoid mismatch expectations that would de uh, degrade trust between platform and product engineers. And so in the interest of time, I'll provide only one example of this, uh, which is to provide an easy decision framework driven by the status of your tool. Again, I'm gonna take the case. I'm not gonna say it, so if you wanna take a picture or something, I'm gonna drink some. Oh. All right, so I mentioned common pitfalls for platform engineers, and one of them is to take on too much integration work. So like my last slide, uh, there is room for that, especially in like early experimental mode, but that's ultimately not scalable, nor are we often the right people to be doing that, right? Example is like testing, right? We can certainly create or recommend testing tools for, you know, or methods, but we can't be the ones writing application tests, right? Um, that requires domain uh, knowledge, and luckily if we're doing our jobs right, the time we save uh, by providing support frees up product engineering teams uh, to take on that application-specific work. And so lastly, we have platform architecture. I promise this is where I start talking about Go more, uh, which is the architecture that platform engineers are building to support application development. And again, the function of this architecture ties directly to the first support strategy we talked about, which is to make building sustainable software easy by consolidating efforts and cognitive load centrally. And so we already talked about high-level principles. Um, next are just a couple of architecture design simple, uh, principles. And so the first right, is to embrace design-driven architecture as a core principle. Um, to my final point before, right, we, have the, we are often able to move uh, more with intentional design. And this, in, this intention is what enables us to minimize the technical debt and risk that leads to unsustainable orgs. And so this can be broken down into so many pieces, but I'll omit that for, for now. Secondly, our, our architecture should be complementary to those of our users. Oops, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> when we prioritize our work, right, we should be driven by the needs of our app developers in our organization, whose architecture should be, oh man, I'm so sorry. My notes are getting stuck, okay. Um, let me reset. When we prioritize the work, right, it should be driven by the needs of our application developers in our organization, whose architecture should be a reflection of our pain and users. Um, and this is why platform engineering, right, is a steady r rather than a fast evolution, right? The way we organize ourselves and prioritize work should be grounded in the reality of the types of problems that product engineers face, right? Ultimately, we're not here to tell other developers what to do, we're here to tell them we're here to support them in how they and what they want to do. And I have put this up here. I don't know if you've seen Alex Adolgo's uh, talk on platform, uh, on platform engineering. Um, he says, hell is other platforms. And the reason for that is, right, like often the pitfall of platform engineering is to build too much tools, right? But an overwhelming number of tools is not the goal, especially when they're custom ones, right? Um, there should be enablers of our goal to build, to, to build engineering organizations. And so instead, right, we often need to be managers of chaos, uh, which leads me to some design tensions. Um, and so first, we have what I think is the hardest tension to balance, which is standardization versus flexibility. And this is a design tension that I think Go navigates super well in the language context, especially if we've seen it grow more and more in maturity. Right? It is a relatively opinionated language, but it also does have the flexibility that enables development across multiple contexts, whether that's infrastructure management, CLIs, service development, et cetera. And that's actually part of why I chose to speak on Go specifically over like Python or Java, et cetera. Cool, right? Platform engineering spans many aspects of the development cycle. Um, so again, it like makes organizational alignment a lot easier regardless of where your role is. Cool, so for example, of uh, one of the things that we've navigated at the New York Times, I mentioned the uh, Golang framework that we have, uh, Gizmo, 
don't know if anyone has used Gizmo. Has anyone used Gizmo? No? Well, it's good because we, we, we aren't, it's in maintenance now, now so <laughs> don't use it. Um, and right now we're facing the consequences of building tens of services, right, with what was like a really opinionated Golang framework, right? It did not age well. Um, and so now we have to revisit our approach um, to runtime development, uh, to runtime development cert, uh, support. Um, and now we also have to reconcile the tech debt that came from that, right? But reflecting on where we went wrong, um, but that we're doing now is to engage with our users more, right? I started this talk by saying that the opposite of isolation is community. And so now we're approaching it from standpoint by driving standards um, across actual teams and our learning communities of practice. And so now what this is starting to look like, which we'll go into more specific examples, is instead of embracing frameworks, we're going down a more like package and library driven uh, way of supporting. And sometimes frameworks are, depends on the language. For Node, frameworks work pretty well, but for Go, we decided to go against that based off of our experience with Gizmo. Um, cool. Next we have the tension of simplicity and complexity. Right? As we respond to the evolving needs of our users, complexity becomes harder to manage um, because the architecture that supports them is probably going to change, uh, whether that's to begin using like event-driven communication or client-side rendering on front end. Um, and so this becomes another area that we need to be intentional about. Right? Like tech debt, complexity is inevitable, but we can compartmentalize it somewhat by making sure our developers, um, that the developer-facing interfaces are simple. Which leads me to the most common so source of complexity in software engineering, which is integrations. So we know the common uh, design principle that, uh, of reducing coupling between services, right? And the same applies here. Uh, integrations are high risk because uh, avoiding coupling is incredibly difficult, right? That's why it's often a huge selling point for some vendors, um, their integrations. Um, but they're also what lead us to lock in, right? Um, and so speaking to vendors, right? Remember I mentioned our automation principle earlier. Uh, so even though I just spent some time talking through design principles, I'm also here to say, give yourself permission to not design at all, right? The decision to build versus buy versus reuse should be uh, platforms uh, bread and butter, and deciding that you don't want to take on the work of building and maintaining a tool is a super valid one. Definitely one we wish we had made with respect to Gizmo. <laughs> right? If we were in our current context, right, we probably would have just uh, built you know, the same uh, libraries that we are now, or just chosen to like, standardize on Jin or some other open source framework, but you know, hindsight is 2020. Cool. So this leads me to a what I call a platform recipe, um, which is a reusable framework with four, uh, with four pillars. Uh, and they allow us to embrace, compartmentalize, or communicate the trade-offs of the, temp the tensions we just talked about. And together, they're actually what gonna, we're going to end up making our developer platform architecture. And so we'll briefly review each of those pillars and then provide some examples in Go. So first, these are the parts of our architecture that provide standardization. Um, two examples of how this might, what this might look like is through templates or opinionated frameworks. Um, and how much you want to lean into standardization is, again, going to be dependent on the context or use case. Um, I already mentioned, like, Go is already a pretty opinionated language, and so we didn't, we didn't feel the need to actually build a framework because, one, there are already some that exist, and two, uh, it's just not as necessary as what you might see with, like, Python or, or Node. Secondly, we have the parts of our architecture that provide more flexibility. So for example, we might modify a framework to become more modular so that developers can pick and choose based off their context. That's how we're decomposing Gizmo right now. We might also extend the way that we do templating by providing a CLI to make them more dynamic. And then thirdly, we have the parts of our architecture that compartmentalize complexity through integrations. And these might be APIs that, uh, APIs that tie the first two pillars together, or like plugins to front end interfaces that developers use to provide visibility that they exist. And lastly, we have the parts of our architecture that communicate our design and decisions along the way, whether that's API docs, standards um, that we set organizationally, or, or decision records for when we decide to build, buy, or reuse. Now, it might be a little strange to have this be part of our architecture, but as I've mentioned throughout this talk, right, touch points and community between platform and product engineers is essential. And especially in a world where we're embracing uh, remote work, software is going to facilitate that. Cool. So in the integrations pillar, I mentioned the plugins as an example to provide visibility. Um, and that's, that's an essential question to answer because visibility is ultimately what leads to adoption, right? 
And so to answer that question uh, of how we uh, provide developer um, or how we provide visibility into our architecture, we have uh, what we call like developer portals. So the emergence of Backstage, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Backstage. Uh, it was a sort of open source project created by Spotify. Um, it's been something that platform engineering has been able to anchor on. And it's a compelling one because it ultimately tells the story of what it means to develop software at your company. And by providing a unified view, not only does our platform become visible, it also facilitates visibility into our services using the portal. So integrations are a crucial part of developer portals, but because it's a centralized entry point, we do have to consider the risk of a singular point of failure. Um, and so this is why it embraces the idea of plugins, which are designed to be easily added or removed from the host application without total coupling. Cool. So I mentioned how developer portals, tell this, developer portals tell a story of what it means to develop software at your company. And I want to give a little bit more insight on that by actually providing concrete uh, examples that uh, will tie the concepts we've seen together. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through each of these steps. All you need to know here is that this is the story we're telling, the one around feature development uh, cycle. And the, most, the ones that were most relevant for platform engineering are the last three, which are development, production readiness, and release stages. So those are the ones that we're going to focus on for the rest of this talk. And note that the examples that I'm going to, we're going to see aren't, aren't like the solution. They're a, a solution. And in fact, a lot of my examples are really naive because, frankly, I don't want to fit too much code on all these slides. So starting with development, which supports the end-to-end -end development cycle, particularly runtime and architecture needs. So we embrace standardization here, the first part of our recipe through runtime templates, which minimize repeatable code by centralizing it into a template. And so what this looks like practically may be a small server file like this, right? This template file not only provides a reusable file, but it acts as a standardization technique by including our organizational framework of choice, which is Gen. From this, developers will only need to modify the parts that need service context, which is highlighted here. Um, and over time, right, we could extend this template to also include standards for other dependencies, which uh, should be formulated together as a community rather than independently in some sort of ivory tower kind of way. Now, if you find frameworks uh, to be too inflexible for your organization's needs, I want to provide more flexible options. I mentioned runtime packages um, as an option, and uh, so that's what we'll talk about now. So here we have more uh, decisions to make, right? including where on the spectrum of flexible we want to be, since these packages are still an avenue where you can inject some standardization. And so to ground this in an example, right, we might have a function. This function is part of a package. Um, again, a dummy function. But uh, this header might indicate something related to authorization that we might want to have a standard for, because all of our, um, all of our products are bundled together through one centralized auth uh, authentication and authorization service. Um, and again, this is just a dummy example, right? But you can see that we have the value automatically uh, being standardized to well, uppercase, say for some reason we want that. Um, and so this is like a technique that we could use. And again, the goal here right, is to save developers the time that they would have spent writing this code themselves. This is just a small amount of code, so you know, you're probably like, why wouldn't I just make them write them? I, you can tell yourself that in aggregate, this would be a lot more time, right? Um, and especially as your organization grows, right, it'll definitely pay back the time of um, spent on developing a centralized library. And so now we can move on to our next portion of the recipe, which is integrations and plugin tools. So in our first example, I showed a template that we could provide, noting that there are some portions that developers would still have to modify. And that was a good you know, start to support runtime development as a platform team, right? But we can improve on that by writing a tool that um, would automatically generate these uh, templates uh, dynamically. Additionally, we can do this template de generation um, in a way that uses those predefined values in, uh, through that tool. And so as you might know, Go has an awesome feature called Go Templates. And so this is a great use case for that. And so this is what, what that code might look like. On the left, we have a generate service template function that uses a config and a go template file to dynamically generate that server.go file in our first example. And in a more advanced state, right, we could even use go templating to generate go code based off of an API spec like open API. Right? And that would save a ton of time um, that we would have spent building a boilerplate uh, code. Which, uh, by the way, this already exists. Check out the open API generator go package if you're interested. And so lastly, along the way, right, we'll need to document our work so that your users can use your tools more smoothly. 
And combining this with the second principle from earlier, right, finding ways to automate this will make our lives a lot easier and set your docs up to be less stale. So in other words, please use GoDoc instead of writing all your docs from scratch. So skipping past the production readiness step for reasons that will be clearer earlier or later, um, next we have delivery, which supports uh, software development by focusing on infrastructure management and support. So similar to our development example, right, we can embrace uh, standardization through config templates. Um, and so also similar to what we saw, right, these templates might be completely static or they might use some templating syntax if you decided to use Go templates, Helm, or some other equivalent. And so this might end up looking like something like this, right? Here we've provided one YAML file template to represent a basic deployment. And so now developers have less config that they need to manage, um, that they need to manage for their development pipelines. And next, right, we use, uh, we embrace flexibility some more um, through a similar technique from before, which is modularization, right? You may have, a, you may have assumed uh, that the deployment file from the last slide was just one for production, right? But we all probably know that production isn't the only environment that we need to manage. So for anyone who has managed multiple environments, right, you might know that there's uh, a lot of overlap in the configuration, but there's still enough meaningful differences that it's not a simple file reuse. And so because of that, modularizing the YAML templates um, we provide by environment can be an easy way to support um, this use case centrally so that there's still uh, consistency. And so next, we have our integration points. So in the development example, the integration example um, portion used Go templates to dynamically generate files, right? I didn't really talk about the interface for that tool though. Um, and that could have been as simple as like a button on a developer front end plugin that used uh, the code to generate the files and write it to a GitHub repository, for example. It could also be in the form of a CLI, which is the pattern that I'll focus on for this delivery example. So again, really simple, kind of dumb code, um, but it represents some of the code that for a CLI deploy command, <laughs> Uh, it uses Cobra to define the deploy command, which uh, expects the environment to be passed in as an argument so that it can use the correct module in the directory structure we just saw in the last slides. And then from there, right, we'd use that file uh, in the rest of the logic that I removed here to deploy the actual application. And then since we've defined a CLI uh, command uh, named deploy, we can integrate it into our CICD workflow by incorporating it into a script or build step of our pipeline. For example, right, we can create a shell script uh, that includes the code and other necessary commands for deployment and then configure our CID pipeline to execute that, that script. Right? And so here, right, we have the your application, which would be a compiled binary of whatever Go application. And the deploy prod is the command that would trigger the deployment process uh, with the production environment variable. Whew. And lastly, even though a lot of what we reviewed uh, should be abstracted away from product engineers, right, we should still provide documentation both for ourselves and to help products gain visibility into what might feel like a total black box, right? Uh, your tools will fail too, and we also don't want it to be the case that developers are confusing our failures with their own. Um, and we can do this, right, through robust and clever error handling that makes it clear when it's, the tools, when it's our tool that's failing and not the application. And lastly, we have production readiness, which supports post-delivery needs of software through production readiness techniques. This work often builds on top of the examples we just saw. So for example, we might extend runtime templates and packages to include features related to reliability. Uh, and that's exactly the example I'll use next. So I mentioned observability is a focus area for me, um, and I'll ground it with an example within that space. And so let's say we use OpenTelemetry standard for, uh, after considering all the trade-offs of defining our own standard, please don't do that. Using one from open source or using a vendor-specific standard, also don't do that. Um, given this decision, right, we sh which should be documented somewhere, right, we choose to embrace standardization further by adding new code to our server file template to support OpenTelemetry. I should note here that there is a package that actually instruments GIN applications specifically, so you might actually want to decide to use that instead, but alas. Switching gears into runtime packages, uh, we should extend the development experience to include modules that uh, provide features relevant to reliability management. So building on my observability example, like we saw earlier, right, we could build a new middleware function to enable telemetry collection instead. Except now we have technical requirements that require us to be very cautious about 
any performance implication. So we're not really comfortable with bloating our request with yet another middleware function. Um, but we know that telemetry collection is important, right? How else are we going to debug our applications, right? Um, so we think really hard, do a lot of discovery and research, da 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 da, and come up with a potential solution that might involve using eBPF. Which eBPF is super cool, right? It's way more performant, but uh, we'd have to do a lot of development to make that happen, right? And so even if we can build a library around it, right, that's still a lot of work, especially since you know it is somewhat new. But again, I mentioned industry awareness is an underrated skill for platform engineers. And so because you know that open telemetry is uh, a thing, um, you look into them and see, is this something that they're currently supporting? And so you find that, yes, short answer. But you also find that, oh crap, it's not that developed yet. Do I use it? They're only in alpha, right? Um, and those are the sign those are the sort of like technical decision making uh, the technical decisions that you'll have to make. Um, and so this is also where I will speak some gospel to open source, um, which is uh, also open telemetry really needs Golang developers. So <laughs> if you're interested in auto instrumentation, definitely hit them up. Um, but on a more like specific to this uh, talk scale, right? There's, there's a world in which we build this from scratch, right? But one, not only will we have to maintain that, but two, right, like we're wasting, we're wasting our time by not contributing to the open source community. So for a lot of, for a lot of platform engineering, uh, they don't, it's what they consider, it can be low code. Um, but I think this is like where we would actually inject like our development skills, right? I know a lot of platform engineers, they often just spend their, their time like wrangling um, configs and you know YAML and da 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 da, but I really think like open source can be the bread and butter of platform engineering. So again, right, like this is something that we're actually considering doing now uh, is contributing to the open telemetry standard because again, it's like we could wait around for them or we could just help them out. And so why not help them out and also bring the entire industry forward? And that's enough on the uh, on the open telemetry. I promise. Um, so building, oh, just, you know, building on observability use cases, uh, we can also use the meta telemetry and more specifically metrics, right, to enable rollbacks in our CI/CD pipeline for when we release a bad change. And so this is the integration portion of the recipe I mentioned. And in the interest of time, I won't show an example. Um, so let's just move on to this next last piece. Right. Lastly, all the different components and decisions can quickly get overwhelming, um, even when designed with a lot of intent. Uh, not only do those decisions need to be reflected somewhere, right, but we also need to understand that, like, if we're managing infrastructure, that those infrastructure incidents are ours too, right? And the process of incident management should be one that fosters collaboration and knowledge sharing, which is a value that's reflected in our principles. And so what this looks like can be a little tricky depending on whether you have an SRE org um, and their specific operating model, but regardless of organizational structure, driving clarity over what incident uh, support looks like is crucial to avoiding broken trust when our platforms inevitably fail. All right, so now that we've walked through the three components of our platform, let's ground this into a concrete example by framing it through the lens of the feature development cycle from earlier. So starting from the left side here, uh, let's say you're a product developer building a new Golang service uh, because that's your organization's primary language, like the New York Times. So to get started, you enter the developer portal integrated with an artifact um, manager, select the bundled ser uh, standardized service template, enter details like service name, et cetera, and then our integration generates that service for you using uh, the CLI tool that we mentioned um, that uses Go templates and has integration with GitHub. Now you're ready to develop your service. Dep depending on your development needs, you might utilize our organization-specific modules. Maybe you'll just rely on the ones that are open source. Um, and from there, you'll continue to use GitHub until the PR approval process is done. And from there, right, you enter the delivery focus part of your platform. And so that Go service template that we use also includes the config templates now. And the CI st stage can use that to build, test, perform static code analysis, et cetera, et cetera. And since our portal includes CI CD uh, integration, let's say we use Drone what the Times uses, developers can easily gain visibility into each of those steps, which is especially useful for when they fail. And if the CI stage passes, right, a CI integration then pushes build artifacts that were generated in the CI stage, providing access for it uh, for the rest of our stages in the pipeline. Again, the developer portal uh, provides visibility through its artifact repo manager and drone integrations. 
And those artifacts, right, could be used uh, during continuous deployment to perform things like infrastructure management, pre-production testing, et cetera. And then using GitHub or its portal integration, right, we move on to tasks related to release management, like approvals, release tagging, release documentation, et cetera, et cetera. And then after successful testing and approvals, service, the service is deployed to production using our deployment template files from earlier, but with additional safeguards like the automatic rollback features we mentioned in the production readiness example. And finally, we've concluded the delivery process and head into maintenance mode, which is supported by production uh, readiness tools that we use to observe and monitor our systems. All right, I breezed through that last section, um, but before I conclude, I want to bring us back to where we began. And so if you remember this little square, um, or, wow, it's been a long day, <laughs> and it's only 10 a.m. Um, but anyway, now that we've reviewed this, um, reviewed the patterns and the principles and the support uh, or, or architecture stack, um, just wanted to give you like an overview, just give you a final sort of overview, right? We started by saying that culture, um, automation, and measurement are important aspects of our platform. And I hope that you were able to see, especially that culture aspect of it. Um, for me, that's been like super important in my, my, time, at, in my time at the Times. Um, our Go community has pr traditionally been very insular. And so as we've grown more and more and more, right, being able to figure out the sort of like cultural tensions within that has been super crucial. And I've learned so much from that community and whatnot. Um, but definitely, like, it's something that we still need to evangelize um, further. Our, to be very frank, our Go community isn't as diverse as I wished it would be. And so I guess my final note that I want to lean on is um, to, lead with, to lead with intention in how you interact with others, the kind of code you contribute, um, and to contribute to uh, open telemetry, because I keep mentioning it. So, um, so that's all I have for you. Um, yeah, that's my Twitter handle if you want to follow me. Um, and yeah, that's all I've got. Yeah.